I think what I'm going to do is just sort of ask each of our panelists um, to just tell us a little bit about themselves and then just give us you know, a 30 second or minute long sort of high level, where are we at in the state of IOT uh, right now? Um, we have, uh, just going f uh, far along the far side there, uh, Falcon is joining us from uh, two dot, 12 dot, pardon me, I just want to get that right. Jeff Wilbur is right beside me, he's the director of the Online Trust Alliance. Katie Watson is a policy advisor, that's Katie right in the middle there, from uh, ISOC in uh, Washington, D.C. And Mike Hoy has come to us from Toronto today. He's the uh, engineering community manager at Mozilla. I did give the little bio, but feel free to mix in some biographical details where you think it's appropriate uh, as you're chatting. And I'll start. So I'm a political reporter now, but I spent a decade as a tech reporter, and my first tech story was the IPO of Netscape. So that was a little while ago, and a lot has changed since. Um, and I've been doing the politics thing for about a decade, and I very much enjoy coming to these events. It's my uh, annual or semi-annual dip back into all things tech. So uh, why don't I start with you, Jeff? You're sitting right next to me. Um, give me your 30-second high-level view of where are, are we at with IoT these days? Big issues, going, moving forward, moving sideways. Um, where do you want to start? Yeah, sure, just to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, you said director of the Online Trust Alliance. I am an internet society, so about a year ago, the Online Trust Alliance, which was a smaller nonprofit, rolled into the internet society. We had developed a framework for, a trust framework for the internet of things. Uh, and that's really kind of where I'm coming from on this panel. And it is a, uh, a list of principles that cover security, privacy, and life cycle aspects of internet of things. Life cycle is something people often forget because a lot of times you're, you're building connectivity into things that have a much longer life cycle than our phones mm -hmm. and some of the throwaway tech that, that we think of today. Um, we also look at it very comprehensively in this framework from the standpoint of not just the devices, which a lot of people look at and they kind of look at that kind of by in isolation. We look at the apps that control the devices and the backend services that support them because you really have to look at the whole system comprehensively. Um, I think we're in the very, very early stages of getting this right from a security privacy standpoint. <laughs> you and I were chatting earlier. There's a, a big challenge in IoT with the, you know, I'll call it headroom of the hardware that gets put together for these devices. They, we're so used to and we take for granted, you wake up and you look, oh, 43 apps on my, my phone got updated last night. Well, there's not a lot of memory and not a lot of processing power in these devices. And so it's much more of a challenge and battery life and everything else comes into play. So even just software updates are a challenge for some of these devices. And so I think we're on the very early stages of, of getting this right. Uh, and meanwhile, millions and billions of products are being sold, which is creating a, a big risk and attack profile uh, out there, both for individuals that own the products and they can be used as botnets back to attack the internet itself. So, so be very scared for the there. next hour and a half in our discussion. <laughs> it's, uh, we're, we're definitely going to get into uh, security. Yeah. Katie, you're in the center of the universe, Washington, D.C. Uh, what's the state of the world look like to you? Um, so, you know, the United States is very new to, this, to figuring out what's going on with IoT. The White House put out a report this past week actually on enhancing security against botnets that called for increased IoT security and called for a multi-stakeholder process to figure out how to secure IoT. But um, I agree with Jeff. I mean, this is the IoT devices are being used in more and more ways. Sometimes when we seek them out and when we know they're being used, like smartwatches, Fitbits, Alexa, things like that. But a lot of times in ways that we don't know, like in smart cities, you know, there's connected mm -hmm. light posts and streetlights and things like that now. Um, and so it's really important that we start figuring out how exactly we make sure the networks of these devices are attached to are secure. And in Canada, there's a really interesting process that we're working on right now to do exactly that. It's a multi-stakeholder process convening civil society and government and private sector and academics and young people to figure out what kind of policy or regulation recommendations we can make as a group to address IoT security from every level, from the very, very beginning of when those devices are thought up to when they reach consumers. Because you know, there needs to be education and security efforts made at every step of the way. Um, especially because we're dealing with a lot of legacy devices that now can't be upgraded or can't be, uh, their software can't be updated to protect against known viruses or known attacks. Uh, Katie, just before we move on to Mike, I want to ask you this. Um, we know that the current president's um, infatuation technology is largely around his smartphone uh, in the morning. But 
and we know there's a lot of noise on all sorts of other things that the president is, is interested in, immigration, you name it, trade. On technology policy, my sense was Obama was kind of engaged on this. Is the White House engaged? Has it changed? Are there people there that are interested and want to do things in this space? You know, I think that there are definitely people there who want to do something. It really depends on the day as to whether or not I think it's mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, that sounds about right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really hard to, to make any predictions with this administration. But I think on Capitol Hill, there's definitely a drive to do something because we're realizing more and more, especially as, you know, Facebook Cambridge on Analytica is totally separate, but it, it has awoken the idea that maybe your data is not secure. Maybe the devices we use are not so secure. We've put our trust in a lot of technology that we don't necessarily understand. And so I do think that there's the drive there and the political will there to do something. All right. Uh, Mike, uh, it, it, tell a little bit yourself and what uh, Mozilla is up to in this space. Uh, well, I'm a, a veteran systems administrator who's come to Mozilla from uh, a long career as, as, a, as an administrator of various systems of various scales. And it's been really interesting for me to watch systems over the years go from something the size of a room to something the size of a desk to something the size. Of, and now, of course, none of us will leave the house without a supercomputer in our pockets, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, that's globally connected. But at the same time, over the course of that, magnificent technological evolution, uh, the state of internet security and the state of internet uh, IoT device security is roughly where the automotive industry was in about 1958, right? Where no seat belts, et cetera. No seat belts, yeah. but more importantly, the costs of failure are very di diffuse, right? The, we, don't, we didn't have a state at the time where manufacturers were accountable for failures in the devices. Or for the costs were borne largely by society, largely at the periphery of the market. And um, it's taken a great deal of effort and lobbying and engineering to get that market to the point now where cars, modern cars are these well-oiled miracle boxes that will protect their users from just about anything. Um, but it's taken a great deal of cooperation between the industry, the government, uh, standards bodies, and consumer agencies to get us to this point. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for us here, and this is Mozilla's position, is that there is a great deal of opportunity for collaboration between industry manufacturers, um, users, uh, consumer groups, particularly around the ideas of security, of integrity of your data, and informed consent in particular. One of the things that it's, you talked about how in users can't know or don't know what's going on in uh, their phones at any given time. Uh, and at the moment, if you look at the box of a phone, you can't know. Like there is no way for a human to look at that device and understand the implications of what it is that they're purchasing. Mm -hmm. In the same way, for example, that uh, if you have a can of paint or a can of bug spray in your house, uh, someone who's completely illiterate can look at that label and say, okay, I know that this is flammable, right? I know that this is liable to explode if I put it in certain contexts. And um, right now we don't have a way for unskilled people, who in this context is virtually everyone, yeah. um, to make an informed judgment in this space. And I think that those two things are going to be the next big places that government and uh, consumer groups have an opportunity to shape really meaningful policy is giving individuals the ability to make informed choices uh, about what is happening to their data, their lives, particularly now that the software we've built is everywhere and in everything. Uh, you may already know this, but again, I'm coming back into tech and things like that, and I'm told that this IoT market in Canada in a couple of years is going to be worth in excess of $20 billion. That's a lot of money, in, even in Canadian money, guys. Um, and Foud, you're trying to get a piece of that $21 billion and your company 12 dots. So tell me, where's, uh, where's the state? You might want to tell us a little bit about what your company is doing right now, sure. actually. That might be a good intro as well. Okay. Um, so first of all, 12 dot, we, we focus on security, right? Cybersecurity, and we focus on IoT cloud mobile. And so we've been doing IoT testing and evaluation probably six, maybe eight years now. We've been helping create the standardization for it. So we're on an IEC committee, uh, what's called SE41. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already created a reference architecture for IoT. And now we're heading up um, creating the security and privacy framework uh, that's necessary for that. Uh, I'm also, um, I'm the Canadian chair for SC27, uh, which is the ISO committee that creates all the uh, cyber standards uh, that everyone knows. 27,000 series is one that a lot of people know. Um, but I'm now the uh, editor just uh, last month. I'm now uh, the just, Can I stop you there because I'm just curious. Yep. Is there a lot of disagreement, a lot of quick consensus when you're building those standards? I mean, I'm just going to say, how controversial is it to try to set some of these standards? So it, it was controversial to get to where we are right now. So um, 
ISO is based on consensus. Mm -hmm. So it took us three years to say, here's what we need to build because you can't boil the ocean. Uh, when we tried to write standards for cloud computing, the one thing we learned was, hey, we're taking way too much on. So what we did from an ISO context was we said, okay, let's do what's called a study period. So we get all the experts in a room and we, you know, we argue over what aspects are the most important for the industry. And that's where we came to creating what's called or proposing a standard 27070, which is IoT um, requirements for security and privacy. So from that, we determined that we need to focus on key elements. One is the organization, because you can't just look at the product, right? Everyone's so focused on the product, and the product has multiple different elements. It's got potentially an actual device, you've got middleware, you've got cloud, and you've got all these different components. So let's not focus so much just on the solution per se. Let's focus on the organization that creates that product. Do they have the process and procedure in place. So for example, when they're dreaming up this great solution, okay, are they thinking about things like threat modeling, right? Did they think about when they started to do the whiteboarding, how is this going to be attacked? Because if they didn't, they should. And then when they started to code the different elements before it actually got to their first build, were they doing testing against it? So for example, a lot of uh, developers will use third-party libraries to quickly get to market, those kind of things. That's great. As a security practitioner, I'm okay with that. But what I'd like to see is, did they actually look at the risk of using those security modules in that product? Not just take it arbitrarily, say, hey, this is gonna fix our problem, let's just use it. Actually understand who touched it, where did it come from, what does it do? And then what, the, what is the actual, what's called attack surface of that piece of code? And, and so, just to drill down a little further on that, then what's your sense then of the buy-in then from companies that will get into the space to adopt these sorts of standards and adopt this new way of thinking about process early on? So it's definitely, you're seeing a shift. And, and so what's happened is uh, there's an organization in Canada called the Standards, uh, Canadian Standards Association. Mm -hmm. And so they, they do two things. One, they help create standards. And then two, they do testing and evaluation. So they've been working with BC Hydro and they've created a program where BC Hydro is recommending products for IoT products for use at home. So BC Hydro approached CSA and said, listen, we're not comfortable just putting our sticker on these products anymore because if one of these gets compromised, we're liable potentially, we don't want to be sued. Um, so Lawyers. <laughs> so because of that, what they decided to do, they approached CSA and, and CSA basically said, okay, how do we kind of create a program to, do, to evaluate and know what the product is and, and, all, and what we're getting into? So that's what they've created. So there's an actual pilot right now going on where they've created this entire framework for testing and evaluation. It's really three parts. So one, there's a self-assessment for the vendor where they basically just enter a questionnaire and it's sent back to the CSA um, team. Then they do an audit based on that questionnaire. And then finally, there's a penetration test. And that gets them an actual rating. And then that rating goes that they can share with BC Hydro and say, hey, we've got like a two on this and here's our maturity level for our product and our organization. And so BC Hydro has a certain um, uh, assurance that they can trust that product or not trust that product. Or BC Hydro may say a two, uh, two is high? Or two is high. Two yeah, high. Yeah. So BC Hydro may say, uh, in this application, yep. we can use this vendor's product at a two level. Yep. In other situations, less of a threat, we yep. can use a one, one product or something like that. Exactly. That's interesting. Yep. Uh, Jeff, I want to ask you, can, can you write a standard that incorporates trust? Is, or, or maybe there is one, maybe I don't mm -hmm. know if there is one, but can you, can you write can you well, write code, essentially? Can you code trust, I guess, is the, is, is, is the question. I don't think in a literal sense you can, but because trust has so many facets to it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, trust in the security side, you could write code that is more secure than something else, mm -hmm. and so you could trust that it, it's less vulnerable. In a sense, uh, privacy is its own category regarding trust. Mm -hmm. People want to know what data are you going to collect, what are you going to do with it, how much control do I have over it, uh, and there's a huge spectrum in all those dimensions. Uh, and and uh, so I, I don't think you can hard code trust if that's yeah. you know what you're getting at. But it's an important thing, and some of it is just a feel, a reputation almost, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. rather than a, a binary uh, sort of thing. Um, maybe I get the two of you to talk about this. I asked. Katie, I'm going to ask you this question, and I asked it of Jeff earlier when we were talking. In a lot of organizations, we have a chief privacy officer. A lot of organizations, it's mandated to have a chief privacy officer. Is it time that major organizations think about having a chief trust officer that might incorporate technical, but also marketing, branding, that a more holistic approach, if your company is trying to convince a consumer that 
we got it on the technical side and business processes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's a bad idea, especially because so many of the, the major companies now, you look at Facebook, Google, Twitter, device makers, their product runs on trust. If we don't trust them, we don't use them. And then, you know, that obviously is a huge harm to the business. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that you would build that in at the, the ground level. Um, I think it's difficult, though, because consumer trust isn't necessarily just built or based on that product or that company's model. It's based on the, the ecosystem, the entire environment of these devices and of the, the programs that we use on them because they're so interrelated at this point. You know, I have an Alexa at home who, you know, it, it freaks me out that I have one of these, but... Um, <laughs> was that, did you get that just to, because you want to see what it was like or you were actually, it was this is going to change my life for the better, which... Is, yeah, my mom gave it to me, which is very, very sweet. Okay. Um, and I do play <laughs> trivia with her, which is great, but she freaks me out. But I use her with so many other, her, I use it with so many other <laughs> applications that, you know, I, I worry not just about what that device is doing, but what all the different applications and um, services that I have on it are doing. And same with my phone. You were talking about, you know, you have so many apps on your phone. I don't just worry about the security of my device, but everything I've used on that. So if you're going to have a chief, tech, or a chief trust officer, mm -hmm. I almost wonder if it's better to have some sort of, I don't know, a group that has representatives at lots of different companies and devices, because it's got to be a collaborative effort. Everybody's got to be on board. Everyone has to be working together to make consumers feel like they are secure, to feel like their privacy has been protected, and to regain their trust when using these services. Uh, Jeff, let, I'll let you maybe repeat some of the things on uh, your, your thoughts on a chief trust officer or, or some similar Yeah, sort I of think position. it's an interesting concept. I, I think there it may be going on now even without the title. You mm -hmm. know, people that are kind of looking at that trust comprehensively in organizations, and it might come from the, the marketing side, it might come from the, the privacy side uh, of the executive suite. Uh, I, I agree with Katie. One of the challenges is the, the ecosystem. You don't know how these products are going to be used, and they're often used or very often used in conjunction uh, with others. And when I was at a smart home conference a few weeks ago, and one of the, the words that popped out in a lot of the panels there was a curated ecosystem. So a lot of the folks, like some of the ISPs that are offering smart home bundles into, you know, for consumers, uh, or retail, large big box retailers that are offering uh, IoT solutions, they're sort of curating what they have so that they can look at it from a, a standpoint of trust, that they know what they're dealing with, can kind of draw at least reasonable lines, a box around it, uh, and to the point where a lot of them will kick out devices that don't conform if they find oh. that there's a security vulnerability or they aren't adhering to some standard. Uh, and I don't mean a technical standard, but just kind of a, a best practice kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think it's happening, uh, but it's, it's not formalized. It's not codified. Uh, Mike, let me, yeah, I want to come back to your analogy about the car companies mm -hmm. from the 50s. And uh, as we think through that analogy, things that drove change in the automotive business was eventually consumers, um, mm -hmm. you know, and media organizations were tracking car accidents and consumers started to demand stuff. And then mm -hmm. governments got involved. Somebody has to drive now in this space, in the IoT space. Um, are consumers ready to pay for more security? Are consumers going to move this forward? Is it going to be folks like you yelling at companies, trying to pull people together? What's going to drive the push towards better security for IoT devices? I think that the key point there is information and the ability to, for a consumer to make an informed decision about what's going on. Okay. The, uh, as often as not, we like when our information leaves our phone, we don't get to see how it's being handled. We don't get to understand what is going on in the cloud at the far end and so on. Uh, and a lot of the systems that we rely on day to day are foundationally based in this implicit trust. Like We never ask ourselves what relationship our telephone company, for example, has with our ability to connect to the internet, despite the fact that they carry all of those bits from point A to point B. Um, we also, have been just the same as point, trust the trust in the notion of computing uh, can mean, as you said, a lot of different things, but we don't often conflate the idea of technical trust, like the reliability in the code at the endpoint, with the trustworthiness of the actors who are operating those machines. Um, the GDPR is a good example for this. Uh, the number of companies that have recently gone out of business just because the European Union has said you can no longer do these very basic things with people's business is an indicator of how much implicit trust is relied on to take advantage of people. 
Mm -hmm. um, and with that in mind, I think that what we, actually, we ha should be pushing for collectively, um, and certainly I hope with organizations like the CSA involved, mm -hmm. is this set of not only standards uh, that we can set as a minimum bar, and like I say, these aren't modern automotive standards that I'm looking for here. Right, yeah, sure. Right? These are 1964 <laughs> automotive standards. Like maybe seatbelts would be nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, but once we have a, a way of communicating or once we have a set of iconography or a set of basic security standards saying this is what happens with your device, this is what happens to your data when it's in our possession, uh, and the other side of that is liability and accountability for when things go sideways. Um, once we have those things, then we have a framework for managing risk, then we have a framework for managing liability, uh, and then consumers and individuals have a lever for making better decisions, right? That's when organizations like Consumer Reports can get involved and say, well, all of these organizations meet this bar, but if you want a better privacy options or if you want improved security on this front, these are the choices you have, and that can effectively drive market change. Um, Vaughn, I want to bring you in specifically on maybe role for government, and just because you're in a government town. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, of course, the seat of the all Canadian federal government. And uh, for those who may be watching from, from elsewhere, uh, the current government elected in 2015 has made an innovation agenda right at yep. the heart of its uh, economic policies. And it has really stressed artificial intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. Prime Minister Trudeau, is, as he travels around the world, talks about he's trying to recruit artificial intelligence experts here, big data, analytics types. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, I'm off to the G7 on Friday. And the G7, I've covered these summits since 2005, they're going to mm -hmm. issue a communique on artificial intelligence, which mm -hmm. is, I think, a real big deal. Big preamble to say. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of talk from policymakers in this town. I'm wondering, does it work down to your level? Mm -hmm. um, is Canada putting in places infrastructure, whatever it might be, to help businesses like yours succeed in the space you're working in? Yeah. So, I, I mean, publicly, no. Okay. I have heard rumors that there is a lot of talk about a cybersecurity framework for small, medium business that's been going on. Mm -hmm. Um, with, with the potential to um, SMBs who basically meet certain requirements would get things like tax credits because they're putting in the necessary framework, right? Um, and and just to interrupt there, the federal government in Canada did announce, I think, $750 million for yeah. cybersecurity over the next five years in its last budget. So. Yeah, and, but a lot of that is going to um, backfill because we're so far behind mm -hmm. to help uh, like uh, the RCMP and uh, a CS, uh, CSAC and... Uh, other organizations just get to where they need to be to close right? some digital doors. That's, that's right, um, because if you look at if you look at say what's going on in the UK and the EU, where they are, they're already created policies. They've already created things for cloud computing. Um, they're looking at IoT, what they need to do. Uh, EU has. Um, a directive where they're looking to, uh, similar to what CSA is doing in Canada, they're looking to mandate products that are going into different sectors have to go through a formal um, assessment. And then from that, you can use it in telecommunications, you can use it in government, you can use it in the school, because you know what it's been tested and certified to. Um, and that's something that's critical to them. And so we need to kind of look at that and say, within our different industries, what, what do we need to do to protect those things? And AI, like if, if you just look at AI, a lot of organizations just, if you start to, the Alexa, it starts to collect all this data on you, right? So it knows who you are, it creates a profile for you. And then from that profile, it knows who you are, what all your interactions is. If someone gets that, like for me as a security practitioner, you become a target. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm targeting you specifically, then I know typically where you're gonna eat, I know who your friends are, I know you, know, you typically leave for work at this time, and that's what makes it dangerous. So if that information is not secure, and if we see a lot of the cloud, not going after the cloud guys, but if you get into the cloud, then all of a sudden you get all this information, and now I can get that, right? Uh, the thing that scares me is the voice printing, right? Um, I'm not gonna name anyone, but we were called in by customers of ours to basically say, hey, do they voice print? And it's like, yeah, yeah, we were able to show that a lot of these services voice print. So if you take a voice print, it actually correlates to a number. So if I have that number, I'm you. That's what's scary, right? And it, it's, that's that's a scary part. Like so, as a yeah. security practitioner, as I said, this uh, is you get know, scared the morning yeah. edition. Yeah. yeah. So we bought some of those. We we bought some of the products. Again, I'm not going to throw the names out there, and we take them apart. I mean, that's what we do. We we buy stuff. We take them apart. Um, we've been hired by customers. We we've attested well over 300 IoT products and solutions end to end, and we're able to get into every single one of them, one way or another. 
Um, we don't public, like we're hired by customers to actually understand what the risk is of using specific things, and we just give them the report. And but we're we're able to get and into you them. hope that they fix it. But of course, that's yeah, up and to phones them to phones through. are easy to get into. Yeah, anyone who thinks their phone is secure is kidding themselves. Because that you will use, I can guarantee you, you will use a public Wi-Fi, and we got you. <laughs> okay. Right? Like. Um, can I weigh in on this? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, on yes, please. Thing. Sure. So yeah, yeah I've, I've attended a lot of IoT conferences recently, and there's huge promise in AI. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the things that they talk about from a market expansion and innovation standpoint is until AI comes into the smart home, for instance, and can start to predict what you want, it's still kind of this disparate puzzle that you have to put together yourself. So there's huge promise there, and I think there's there's a lot of focus on it on the positive side. But on the flip side, you have the issue of, uh, you know, voice printing or just dots that couldn't previously be connected with your data that mm -hmm. seem anonymous in their yeah. own little buckets mm -hmm. suddenly become connected through AI, mm -hmm. and it creates a huge privacy risk and concern. Mm -hmm. So it cuts both ways, and it's going to be a challenge mm -hmm. to find the right balance between the two. And it seems to me, just uh, just my input on policymakers, when I say policymakers, federal authorities uh, in this country or others, it's privacy, sure, but it's more security. I mean, it's China, Well, Russia, it's trustworthiness. If you look at yeah. trustworthiness, a lot of organizations um, under the name of trustworthiness include security, privacy, reliability, a whole bunch of other concepts, right? Mm -hmm. So um, even ISO is moving to this term of trustworthiness because it really encompasses all the things that are IoT. Right. Because an IoT product not only is going to have like the device and all the things we talked about, it is going to have an AI component. And because you want to give that user that experience, right? It's about the experience. So we're not trying to shut everything down. I think that's crazy. I think what we're saying is give the user a great, safe experience that they can trust where the data is and it's protected. That's all we're saying. And, and so I think that's what consumers should want. They just don't know what the questions are they need to ask of their government, of their provider, of anyone, because it's, to them it's so technical, how could I possibly understand that? So we gotta bring it down to the consumer level to say here's what you need to consider when buying a product, um, and then here's what you need as a vendor, and then here's what you need as the government. Um, and, but we're not there yet. Like we're, the, the discussions are happening, but we're just not there yet. Katie, I want to I keep going just on the G7, just because we're on the eve of the G7, I think this is remarkable. The document, just so you know the way that a G7 the issues of communique, over the last eight or nine months, there would be what's called a G7 Sherpa from each country, a senior ministerial level person who negotiates with other G7 Sherpas to come to some place that they think their leader can sign off on. And so the leaders will sign off on a document that is going to be called a common vision for the future of artificial intelligence. Not, you may have talked to people in Washington who might be involved in the United States' contribution to this. But, but Katie, the, the question, and Mark put this in my mind, about the kinds of policy tools you think would be compatible with innovation, compatible with these sorts of technology changes. Do you have some advice? Do people ask, I'm assuming people ask you from time to time for your advice in this space. What can, what can I as a policymaker do here? Sure, and I actually, I first want to respond to what Bad was saying also, sure. because in the, as I mentioned earlier, we have this multi-stakeholder process to figure out how to secure IoT. And we had our first meeting back in April and there were 60 individuals in the room, 20 online, who all were actively engaged in this process. And we tried to figure out step one, you know, what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. And there was overwhelming consensus that step one is consumer education. There mm -hmm. has to be something happening. It has yeah. to be at every level. We need to figure out how to make consumers aware of the fact that these devices exist, what they are, what they look like, how they're already using them, how they might use them in the future, and how to take steps to be secure on their own. For example, I mean, something as easy as changing your password when you get a device is huge, but a ton of people don't do that. And it's a very easy thing that if consumers knew what the risk was, that's not, that's not a hard way to protect your device. So just mm -hmm. wanted to agree with what you were saying. Um, and then as far as you know, how, what kind of policy tools exist in DC to approach these issues, um, you know, we have a lot of really great regulatory agencies who are tasked with overseeing how technology develops, how consumers are protected, um, whether or not they have all figured out what to do with technology kind of remains to be seen. It's, it's a little unclear who has the authority to ensure that consumers are protected and, and when they're not, who's responsible for figuring out the liability and you know these, these issues. So there are tools that exist, but I think government is so often 
retroactive. Something happens, then they respond. Mm -hmm. But with technology, we re really have to be proactive. I mean, a security issue, an IoT security issue, an AI security issue is so much bigger and it moves so much faster than I think issues in the past have. You had kind of a ramp up time, time and there's time to address these problems and the government could move quick enough. And I just don't think that's the case anymore. So I don't know what the, what the next step is, but it seems to me like there needs to be a new tool created that can be proactive and move quicker. And I don't want to keep coming back to, to Trump, but I'm going to keep coming back a little bit to Trump. Let me, so back in the early days of the internet that I grew up, there was that constant struggle um, you know, uh, through the, into the development of ICANN. Do we develop standards at the, you know, an IETF's task force or whatever it might be. But whatever happens, government shouldn't control the internet. Government shouldn't define the standard. Let the technologists in some sort of way figure it out and let it be the property of the world. Um, but I have heard some rumblings that the president thinks the U.S. invented the internet, the U.S. ought to run the internet, the U and I might be overstating things a little bit, but is, it, is government in the United States trying to run this more, or am I a little just, that, that I sh you shouldn't be concerned about it? What, what's your sense? Is, that, is, is there that feeling out there a little bit? I think the government is very worried because they, they especially after the, the Facebook hearings, it became very clear that mm -hmm. our senators and representatives really don't understand how the internet actually works. Mm -hmm. no. And so I think that, <laughs> yeah, and, which is concerning. And I think that largely because of that, there is this, this kind of sentiment growing or these rumblings happening where they realize they need to do something to prove that they understand what's going on and to prove that they can protect consumers because people are really upset about how their data is being used. They don't understand how their data is being used. There's no transparency. Um, so I'm a little bit worried. Or I'm a little wary of saying that there should be some sort of government intervention, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not convinced that it won't happen. Right. So it, it's really going to come down to, though, can Congress agree on how to address this issue, or can the FCC or the FTC figure out what to do next? Um, but it does seem like there's consensus that something needs to happen. Mike, do you want to weigh in on the on this issue? On you know who who's in charge of fixing and inventing and how how do we manage this how do series we manage, of tubes? Yeah. Yes. How do we manage this series of tubes in a in an international, transnational, connected environment? Uh, I think that a couple of years ago, I was just recalling, uh, Lawrence Lessig wrote a book called Code is Law, and uh, his argument at the time was that the foundational laws of cyberspace were encoded in the actual software, and that the nation states uh, don't really have a say in that, and it turns out that has aged spectacularly poorly, um, mm -hmm. because uh, having a monopoly on the use of force in your geographic area gives you a lot of privileges over how the machines in that area actually it work. Turns out. Um, <laughs> But with that in mind, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity here just because uh, at this moment the interests of the average consumer and the interests of the national security apparatus are magically well aligned, right? which doesn't always happen. But at the moment, if you are interested in not having your fridge let your milk spoil because a Romanian teenager has decided to use your fridge to mine Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, the same state apparatus at the time is interested in not having large chunks of the national like computational state. Uh, subverted or weaponized or used to target national apparatus or na other parts of the national infrastructure. Um, so there is an opportunity there for our security agencies and our standards agencies uh, and consumer interest groups to find some common ground about, okay, we need a basic level of things not falling over. We need a basic level of our tools can't be arbitrarily subverted. Our, we need a basic level of reliability across this strata um, so that our water keeps pumping, like so that the electricity, so that our electrical grids keep working. Right. Right. Um, and all of these things, we we can't get ourselves as a society to a point where, when someone makes a mistake by bringing a consumer grade device into their office and plugging it in, because that seems like a reasonable thing to do, and people do it every day, um, that that exposes risk at the national level, uh, to the country, to the national infrastructure, to the national voting mechanism. Uh, or the national voting yeah. process, I should say. Right? Well, and that may be a good segue, Jeff, to just talk about Europe and some new rules about data and privacy. And it, it seems to me states have a legitimate space to say, this is how we're going to enforce some very broad rules about how personal data is going to be traded, is going to be marketed, stored, et cetera. And how does that, you know, Europe's taking a lead that may put it offside with some American companies, Canadian companies. You got some thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it was alluded to earlier, the GDPR, which went into effect May 25th, so very recently, 
uh, has really forced a sea change for companies to, on how they handle data, how they, first of all, just to assess <laughs> where all the data is. That was probably the most difficult task for most of them is to find out where it all is. And then um, there are a number of uh, elements of it that are, are challenging for companies. There's a 72-hour breach uh, reporting rule. You have to allow, you have to be able to provide to individuals the data you have on them. Uh, and then there's the right to be forgotten. And that probably sounds like it would be a very <coughs> significant job for, Blart, I mean, Facebook size yes. organization. Yeah, and I had heard rumblings at one conference I was at that there were, there were uh, groups that were going to just bombard the data protection authorities with, with the, or, or the companies so that they could expose that this just isn't going to be working right, bombard them with tens of thousands of requests at once. So you imagine a company trying to process it's like a DDoS attack. I was going to say your new denial of service attack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like that. sure. Uh, only from a privacy standpoint. So there, it, it definitely has changed the rules. There are a lot of companies. You're talking about them going out of business. Um, there are a lot of companies that outside the EU that actually chose to stop doing business in the EU because they did not want to go through the process of being GDPR compliant. So they just stopped marketing to or having a presence in the EU so that they aren't subject to those rules. But Europe has a much stronger uh, privacy uh, you know, approach for you know, user-based approach than we generally see, well, in the US for sure. Uh, and so, but I think some of that is coming to the US. There's uh, bills being put forth in California that are somewhat aligned with the GDPR. There are a lot of other countries around the world that are using it as a model for privacy. So we're going to start to see that sort of spread, uh, and especially then for larger companies, they're going to have to kind of raise the bar. So we know that, for instance, California is sort of taking the national lead on, say, uh, environmental regulations, on car on They car do emissions. that on lots of things, yes. And could they, they be doing it again here just because there's a lot of apparently tech companies in California and they will insist those tech companies follow a European model, that that would be America's model, therefore? I'm not sure they would, would do it just because of the tech companies in California. I'm not sure the tech companies would necessarily like what's happening. But <laughs> uh, the, the Calif California does take the lead on a lot of consumer-based initiatives. And they would look at it through that lens of this is a benefit to the consumer of protecting data better. Cool. I, once again, I want to just, uh, it, if anybody has a question or a comment here in our room, just pop up to the microphone. And Mark, you're getting signals from the internet thingy. In case uh, anybody <laughs> online uh, wants so to check, um, so let, let, let's uh, let's maybe let me throw out this scenario and uh, let's talk maybe a little bit about tech and specs. I have a, an IoT device, a health device implanted somewhere in my body. Um, can that be upgraded? Can we get to the point where you can we can upgrade the iOS? Somebody's learned how to hack that. Where are we in terms of this is a device that physically is going to be difficult to. Uh, swap in and out, so somehow the software's got to be upgraded. Are we at a place where we can do that? Uh, we're getting there. So I think if, Good. You, you, know, uh, <laughs> if you look at, uh, geez, how many years ago was that? Um, there was a former vice president who had a pacemaker installed, and uh, yeah. Secret Service uh, determined that it was an attack point. Even though he's no longer in government, um, he's still a target. And so they actually had the wireless interface on his pacemaker um, disabled. Because obviously you can walk within proximity, you can actually start a heart attack uh, kind of uh, mm -hmm. position. The device manufacturers in the medical area have definitely woken up to that. Um, and so what they're looking at is what are those basic requirements to uh, facilitate those kind of aspects. FDA has worked on this. So they actually have a list of things that, you know, can you do field upgradability for software? How do you identify vulnerabilities in your product, et cetera, et cetera? It's just a small list, but they're basically asking um, for uh, medical devices specifically, how can you protect that kind of stuff? So there's things like that that are going on. So there definitely is a shift in movement. Uh, one thing I will allude to is uh, Serial Labs has actually got a research project going on right now where they're trying to create a home router that basically says, you know, for devices in the home, here's how you should work. So it's almost given like a profile to say, if I buy my dishwasher, it should work like a dishwasher, right? It shouldn't attack my kids or, you know, <laughs> mine bitcoins or whatever. Right. It should wash my dishes and tell me when it's done or I can start it remotely and that's it. Um, so 
you're seeing the shift in the industry to say, okay, we need products, we need solutions because the consumer of the business doesn't necessarily understand the threat models. And so by creating a model where you need to know enough to say, here's the product I bought and here's how I want it to work, and then let the box do the rest kind of thing. And so I think this, this CIRA project is a great step in that um, direction where they're actually helping to address that need in the marketplace. So you're, you're definitely seeing that shift. And Jeff, I think you talked about this in your opening remarks, talking about designing in, uh, what was the phrase you used I more? I use headroom. Headroom was the mm -hmm. phrase yeah. you used. That, mm -hmm. that, but also product life cycle to know that at right. some point if this doesn't work, if it, you know, a future generation of our, you know, IPv12, mm -hmm. how many, IPv6 gives what, how many devices can be connected, like a gazillion or oh, something like that? that? So <laughs> IPv12, we probably won't need that. Anyhow. Yeah. By the way, today is the sixth anniversary of IPv6. And well, I want to, maybe we should probably come back to that in a second. But anyways, give me your thoughts on these devices and, uh, you know, it's something that's, you know, a hundred feet up in the air on a highway that's some, you know, devices that are right. on, on a lighting so standard. That I, might be I think if you look at industrial environments or smart cities, that kind of thing, they're used to designing for very long life cycles, right? Because mm -hmm. it's going to be out on a pole in the wilderness mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, so that mentality is already there. When you bring it back to more of a consumer mindset in the home, it's typically not there. Uh, and there's more of a throwaway mentality and then you, you have, but yet you have this range of you know, thermostat to maybe a, a light bulb to things that typically last a long, long time in your home, like big appliances or garage door openers, that kind of thing. So one of the things that, that our framework proposes is that you clearly identify what will work and won't work if you're not connected. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can expect manufacturers to uh, you know, provide security updates for, forever. But telling consumers how long they plan to do it and that, that the devices are updatable, and then telling them what will happen if they don't have that connectivity. So that can range all the way from, okay, my fridge keeps working, but it's not automatically you know, ordering my new food from the grocery store uh, to completely bricking the device and you can't use it anymore. And there have already been examples of that, uh, not in major appliances, but like in smart locks, for instance. So. Uh, there's a whole range there, but I think designing for the future and some of the manufacturers we've talked to about this framework and how they can sort of design it in for the long term, uh, talk about the need to do that. They definitely understand that it's a, uh, a benefit and to be able to commu communicate that to consumers and that things are going to shift over time where even basic things we take for granted, like in the last six to nine months, vulnerabilities in both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth came to light, and if you couldn't update anything, you wouldn't be able to update those. And those are ones you kind of serve as the foundation mm -hmm, for all your core. communication. Yeah. So it, it's definitely necessary to do. Um, but the challenge is, especially in some of these low-cost IoT devices, is the cost structure that that creates. And that may price them out of the market, and so there's that tension uh, for a lot of those manufacturers. Well, and we come to back to it. then maybe the higher cost gets a two on your CSA rating, mm -hmm. lowers yeah. a one. It, yeah. I mean, there's different variabilities. We I have would, quite, uh, what, hold, I would like to jump in there. Okay, one sure, Mike. Yeah. One of the side effects of that inability to upgrade as well is that this enormous environmental impact, mm -hmm. right? That most of us at this point have a drawer full of old phones that we can't upgrade and we can't make secure, and so we don't use. Mm -hmm. And those are all devices that now have get like ineffectively recycled or trashed and so on. And the inability for us to maintain basic software standards via security ends up having these enormous negative side effects in terms of environmental costs as well. <coughs> Mark, you're at the microphone. If you're coming to the microphone, this is Mark Buell or on iSoc. So just maybe you want to introduce yourself and say who you are. If you're so Hi, I'm Mark Buell. I'm the Regional Bureau Director for North America at the Internet Society. And I have a question from the Internet. Um, oh, okay. Actually, it's, it's Glenn McKnight. Glenn wants to know what the panel has to say about the issue of appropriate security for the electrical grid. And is OTA uh, working to increase security in this area? Well, Bob, do you want to t try that on first, being the... Sure. sure. Um, so I think, first of all, um, both, I think, government departments and the utility providers are well aware of what the threats are. Um, operators are, especially if you, if you ever read anything about Stuxnet, 
uh, that happened. The first incident was before 2008, and you look at it how you know that was state driven, and then since that time we've seen multiple different um, state driven attacks against that. Um, they've woken up to what the threats are. Uh, the vendors have woken up to what the threats are, and they are cognizant of it. Um, however, if there was an advance attack, could we defend it? Um, my hesitation would not to not have you sleep tonight, but to say is um, we would be susceptible, right? Um, and what I mean is, if you look at Stuxnet, how did they attack it? Okay, does anyone know this? USB key. The deadly USB key. So what they did was they, they, tried, they started a hunt to people who worked in that facility and they did a phishing campaign. And they all, all they had to do was find one guy and they found the one guy. So he basically had a USB key, he was using it as home computer. And sure enough, in the control panel, um, there's computers and a USB drive. So Buddy plugs it in. The second he did that, he compromised the facility. Same thing here, you just need one. You just need one person who basically allows that taking something from the outside to the inside, and then that's how it gets into the grid. So we just have to make sure that we understand that, and if the practitioners are making sure that, I would just fill them with hot glue, for example, right? I mean, <laughs> it's not complex, it's not an overly complex problem to fix, but understanding that risk is the utility providers that nothing from the outside comes inside, and they can basically manage that risk. And, and Katie, I know this is, you know, protecting critical infrastructure from cyber or anything, is, I'm assuming is definitely on Washington's radar. Mm -hmm. For sure, and it's a little bit outside of my, my wheelhouse, yeah. but I mean, there's definitely concern because the, the systems haven't been updated in forever, and so, much of the, so many of the devices probably can't really be upgraded because they run on you know, floppy disks, and mm -hmm. what are you gonna do with that? I mean, mm -hmm. it, and I think, again, it goes back to the education piece. The people working at these facilities are also consumers and may not understand the risk of bringing in something from the outside. Mm -hmm and really the, the gravity of that situation if they do bring something in. So I think that, that would, that's a, a world that needs to be educated in the same way. Those, can, those users, those, those people have to be educated in the same way we educate other consumers to say, there are some serious consequences if this goes wrong. You need to be aware, you need to do your part. Um, we have to work together at, from every level to, to make sure we're all on the same page there. Sure, back to the microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Karen Nicholas. I'm the policy director with the Dom Domain Name Rights Coalition. I just wanted to pick up on uh, the question of regulatory leadership in this space. Um, it's great to point to the GDPR as an example of, of regulators pushing forward and advancing new standards. Um, but on the security side, we're still debating encryption backdoors. Mm -hmm. That's a debate that's very much alive in the US uh, it's alive here in Canada with the latest green paper that was published. Um, Australia is advancing legislation on this issue, uh, mandating encryption backdoors. Um, so how do you win this regulatory debate when governments are still viewing insecurity as a tool for their own uh, 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 needs and offensive capabilities? Anybody want to put their hand up here? Try that one. So that's actually something that we're working on right now is figuring out how to address this issue and it, you know, not to harp on education, but it mm -hmm. goes back to that too because it's very clear that the people who are discussing these bills, who are discussing the possibility of regulating back doors, don't really understand what that means. And I think one of the best examples that I've heard recently is the idea of a TSA lock. So you have these locks that you can put on your, your luggage when you go on a plane that, you know, says, you know, don't come in my bag, but TSA has a key to that lock so that if there is something in there, they can check it out. But one of those locks made its way to, or one of those keys made its way to the internet, and now you can buy them online for like 10 bucks, you can 3D print them. The locks themselves are completely useless because a back door existed. And it's the same thing here. You know, if you have encryption that keeps everyone safe, and personally, I want, I want my bank to be encrypted, I want my, you know, my purchases that I make online to be encrypted, I want my life to be encrypted, not because I'm doing something illegal, but because I don't trust what happens if it's not encrypted. And it's really important to explain that to the people making these legislations to say Because they'll come at you and say, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, exactly. then you won't well, worry about that. Exactly. Right? And it's not always about that. It's not about, you know, am I going to go to the dark web and buy something illegal? It's, 
I want to feel secure when I use the internet. And if my everything I do is encrypted, I do feel that way. But if a backdoor exists, I don't, I don't worry about the law enforcement agents who, if they want to come check out what I'm doing down the line, whatever. But worried about the bad guys. Exactly. Yeah. It's very and it's very easy to get these to get tools, these things. And right now, I mean, there's already tools that you can buy online that will break encryption, and that's only going to get infinitely easier if there's a backdoor. Mike, I see you're nodding your head there. You can open the TSA lock with a popsicle stick. Um, <laughs> it's they're completely pointless at this point. But to the point, to the point you're making of. Um, privacy and security being a trade-off. When you say, I'm not doing anything wrong, so I have nothing to hide, but every single person in this room has curtains in their bedroom, right? Every single person in this room has, will close the door when they're going to the can. Not because they're doing anything wrong, but because We'll, we'll privacy, lock the door in our car when right, we get everybody But because privacy and dignity are yeah. inextricably intertwined, right? The ability, this is another question of control over your information, right? Your ability to retain your dignity as a human being is fundamentally about your ability to decide what you are revealing and not revealing to the world. Right? And if we don't build those, that sense into our fundamental tooling, particularly around the Internet of Things, particularly around tools that will have microphones and cameras in our houses, um, then we will be losing something very fundamental about how we interact with each other and, frankly, with ourselves. I think that, can I just yeah, add something? Absolutely, sure. I think if, if the regulators want to look at this, don't look at what it provides them, but look at how this is going to go ugly. So state governments, we, we've seen how foreign governments are using the internet to attack. Coming back to Katie's point, now imagine if someone wants to target our financial system, but they know what the back door is because all our, our major banks are using the same crypto algorithms. So now they have a back door into them, foreign government gets them, now they can empty every Canadian bank account, put it into a foreign bank. Canadians are broke, our country's broke, and what did we protect? Nothing. Right? Those are the things, if, if they're going to think about this, threat model the entire situation before you make the policy. Don't look at the one-sided to, you know, Johnny down the street who's moving dope from the dark web, like who cares, right? I mean, it, it's, yeah, if they're moving contraband arms, that kind of stuff, I mean, there's ways to kind of do that. Um, but. Let's not risk the entire a country for short-sightedness. And that's what scares me, right? Is that's what we're looking at. It's very short-sighted, and we're not looking at the bigger picture, and the people at the regulatory level um, who should be at the table aren't at the table. And they're making decisions that are going to hurt our country. Um, not just our country, but countries around the globe. And they're not looking at what, how it can be used against our country and Canadians. And that's what they need to consider. If we codify a weakness into our security yeah. apparatus like that, yeah. then what we're really doing is giving bad actors an opportunity to yeah. operate at enormous scale. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's probably unanimity in the room on this, I think, particular point. You talk to tech folks, that's what you hear. Hi, I'm Alan McGilvery from Sierra. I'm going to change the subject a little bit, if I could, uh, just to come back to the issue of consumer awareness. I think that uh, <clears throat> uh, many people are aware of the Dyn attack where $20 webcams were used to launch the attack. Mm -hmm. And I certainly understand the example of I as a consumer, if I have a computer, I have information on the computer that is threatened, so I, you know, if I'm a rational actor, I'll take steps to protect it. But where I have a $20 webcam and, or a fridge that's used to mine Bitcoin, I'd like to understand better what the risks are to the consumer with that $20 webcam, because certainly if it's being used as an attack vector to a third party, I don't care. But are there examples of inexpensive devices like webcams or baby monitors um, actually being yeah. used to, to the detriment of the individual user, not to a third party? So I can give you several examples. So the first one I'll start with is the baby monitors. So um, there's a story in the States where there were parents that had a two-year-old. And so the two-year-old is telling uh, the mom and dad that, um, you know, that their friend, I forget what she called her or called him, um, but, you know, so-and-so comes to visit her at night and they talk, blah, blah, blah. And the parents are like, oh, well, she's just got a pretend friend. So this was going on. Uh, one night, um, the father uh, is going to put his daughter to bed, and he hears a person talking out of the baby monitor. And it turned out to be a 40-year-old man. So talking. it wasn't a pretend friend. It wasn't was a, a pretend real... friend. It was an actual man who had compromised the system and didn't really know who was there, but he knew it was a child, 
it was a two-year-old. And uh, so obviously, fathers can unplug it, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's one example. Um, so baby monitors have been used. The other one, coming back to the $20, so one thing that's happened, um, if you uh, read any of the RCMP reports, what's happening is kids today are using these $20 cameras to do all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm not saying what they're doing is right or wrong, but we have young teenage girls who are basically doing flash things. Um, and because their computer and or camera's been compromised, it's being captured. And then there's obviously an element of our society that preys upon this. They capture the pictures, and what they do is they reach out to the girls um, or guys, and they basically say, listen, um, I don't think your parents would like to see this. I don't think your school would like to see this. Your friends would like to see this. So you know what? You're going to give me private showings on your camera. And this has been a problem with the RCMP. It's not openly talked about, but this, our children are being targeted because of these $20 cameras. So this is going on in our country right now because we don't see it, we don't live it. It doesn't mean it's not happening. It is happening. And we come back to consumer education, I mean, especially yeah. with the... And, and so kids you know, don't understand it. And so yeah. all of a sudden, this girl who just thought she was having fun with her friends, she's in a situation we've already known. Uh, sorry, and I can't remember the young girl's name in Toronto. She took her life because mm -hmm. the one guy told her, listen, if you basically say anything, you know, this is, what I'm, this is how I'm going to ruin your life. She ended up taking her own life because she saw no way out of it. Yeah. So us as the consumer, the parent, the government, let's protect our kids first, right? Education at every level, here's, here's the dangers of using these things. Mike, I saw you nod your head there as well. This is a common problem, uh, in fact, with consumers who are attempting to educate themselves and attempting to solve their own problems. Uh, a lot of operating systems or computers now will present some obscure error message when you're trying to do whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and a quick Google search of that error message will lead you to instructions that say, just download this and install this. And of course, the thing you're downloading and installing is a remote access tool for your computer right, that is right. giving someone else permission to, uh, to do something nefarious with it. Um, we have a we have a very serious education in-depth problem ahead of us. We have a very serious defense in-depth problem ahead of us as an industry to be able to not only make people, give the people the sense that they can be secure, but to try and figure out how we can get to a point where people just don't need to be afraid of this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Like to go back again to the automotive analogy that I'm gonna be riding this entire day. Um, the, uh, like you get into your car and you turn the key and you push the pedal and you don't think about anything under the hood because you don't have to, right? We have the standards in place to make sure that that process works reliably every single time. And that's where we need to be as far as computing security is. Like we need not, we don't just need to get to consumer awareness, we need to get to the point where consumers don't need to be aware of this stuff, where they don't need to be afraid. Back to Mark and the internet. I, yeah, I have a and question. And on that note, here comes the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have a question from Brenda McPhail. Uh, she says, the panel seems to agree that many consumers don't know the right questions to ask about IoT security, and that consumer education is key. So what Brenda wants to know is, so what are the essential questions consumers should ask? Hmm. Well, that sounds like, Kate, a good spot for you to start with. Maybe, yeah. Jeff, you want to weigh in on that one, too, after that. I mean, I think... You know, that's, that's a really good question, and it's a question that I don't know if I'm the person to answer because I don't even know all the right questions that I should be asking about these devices. There's no transparency. I have no clue what happens when my Alexa is just sitting there on my table not doing anything. What I, would, what I personally would like to know, what I think most consumers would like to know is when is my data being used? What data is being collected? How is it being used? What security systems are already in place? How can I be sure that those security systems are working? How do I update them? And then if there is a breach, what's gonna happen? If my security is compromised, if all of a sudden I find out that my, you know, the cameras in my house have been recording me, who do I call? Who, who do I talk to and say, this is a huge problem, what are you gonna do about it? Is it on me, the consumer? Because I don't think I'm equipped to do that. Um, but I'd also, I want to go back a little bit to the, the education component, especially for young kids. We had a, a round table with young people as a part of our IoT security initiative in Canada um, and young people who are both in school, newly out of school, to figure out how do we address this from day one? How do you as a, as a young person get educated? And that group agreed that it, has, it should be a part of the school system. In the same way you have to take math, you have to take science, you have to take history, you should have to take some sort of digital literacy class or digital citizenship class that tells you, starting in kindergarten, 
hey, the internet's amazing, it can do all these cool things, but here's how you use it safely, here's how you're smart online, here are the, some things that, you know, if you see a pop-up and you go to Google and it says, download me, here's what you should be questioning before mm -hmm. you do that. Um, and so that's something that I really hope comes very quickly. And you know, as we were saying earlier, government, governments move really slowly, but we need education for, for, as, for kindergarten and up for everybody all the time, continued education. And then we really need technology companies and the creators of these devices to be at the table to help answer the questions that we haven't thought of yet. Because they're, they're the ones that are making this. And I think that device creators are just as worried about security as we are. They just might not be worried about it until a little bit too late. And I think we're starting, we're in an environment now where everyone's on the same page. Like this is a problem that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. But consumers don't know enough to ask the right questions. But just uh, before I jump in there, uh, Jeff, uh, Mike, in our, uh, some, the company I work for is Global Television and it's owned by a publicly traded company called Chorus. Um, and Chorus thinks it's important that we protect the information in our systems. And so every now and again, I have to take these uh, little modules on digital security. And I think of myself, I've been around a bit, like I know how to protect myself. And I go through these modules and they're kind of dopey, like here's a picture in your office, find the eight devices, touch on them that could be compromising security. And I'm surprised that I often don't get 10 out of 10. I get eight out of 10 and I've been around the block. So it would sort of, it's a long way around of saying, Chorus is a publicly traded company, there's a mechanism to enforce me, the guy who thinks he knows everything, by making sure there's audits that we're all taking these, updating our digital s literacy skills. Should that be maybe something that an SEC or a regulator says, if you're going to be a publicly traded company, you're going to have to perform these yeah. audits from well, time I to time? Well, I think you see that more and more in compliance in corporations today uh, uh, across the board, phishing, you know, sort of testing right, and yes. other security testing. Back to the consumer side, I think the question itself really shows the sad state of where we are in information today. <laughs> um, we have developed, we being Online Trust Alliance as part of Internet Society, a number of checklists for consumers to use. So one was a smart home checklist we did in conjunction with the National Association of Realtors in the U.S. They okay. wanted to help inform their constituency on how do you handle purchase or handoff of a smart home. Uh, which is much more complicated than you know just a key and a garage door opener these days. We also did one, and so and it has a consumer kind of angle to it. We also did one for bringing consumer grade IoT into enterprises. What are the things you need to worry about? So those are sort of foreign objects to enterprise IT folks um, because they act differently. And in all those recommendations, we do things like make sure the firmware is updated, put it on its own Wi-Fi network if you can, because a lot of routers let you do multiple network so it's not on the same one as your laptop and so forth. But, and even I being someone who's in this, if I go, go to a specific product and try to find out its security posture and its privacy posture, I have to read the entire privacy policy and know what I'm Ooh. doing, know what I'm you know, looking for, and I can't get at any of the security information. So I'm, I'm really left with doing a search for that product and hack or vulnerability or some word associated with it to see if there have been problems. So all this information, you guys have been talking about it, it's not bubbled up to the surface in a meaningful way that consumers can use. So you know the Consumer Reports with their digital standard initiative is probably the first to, to take a step there where they're looking at security and privacy of products and not just feature functionality price kind of like they have historically. So their first test was a, a few months ago on five smart TVs, and they found some vulnerabilities. You know, none of them were horrible. They couldn't spy on you, but they, you, know, you could sort of hack in some ways and kind of change the volume or change what the person was watching. It's more creepy stuff than it is serious stuff, but it's a step in the right direction. You fell asleep watching the hockey game, woke mm -hmm. up, oh, yeah. Russian propaganda yeah. on my TV. <laughs> exactly. Right, okay. So, there, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. A lot of these consumer testing organizations are starting to factor this in. Mm -hmm. And back to the question about individual harm uh, versus collective harm from IoT devices, uh, which, which is a consumer reports-like testing company in England, tested a bunch of smart toys last holiday season and found severe vulnerabilities where unsecure Bluetooth connections, so if I'm in a Bluetooth range of this cuddly little toy, 
I can start talking to the child, as mm -hmm. you described with the, the baby monitor. I could lure them to the door. I mm -hmm. could do all sorts of stuff to the point where they banned those products in Germany last holiday season. Uh, so there are, I don't know if there are a sure. lot, I, I haven't heard of a lot of specific examples of harm, but there are a lot of researchers who have found potential harm and products are either changed very quickly or taken off the market or shut down in some way. Uh, so I, th I think it's just a matter of time before we see some serious stories about that. We're going to try and wrap up this panel somewhere around uh, 9.30 or so. Just so, And I thought maybe close with this way. We've been talking a lot about scary things that could happen and bad things that could happen. And oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's dream a little bit. We all, I assume, think that the Internet of Things has some value. Is can do some good things and improve things, and we talked about uh, environmental this or that. Uh, maybe I'll just run through it, and you might have an example of where you went. Wow, this is a really good use that I'm aware of. Things you'd like to see, mm -hmm. what's being done right. Maybe that's a nice place to end things on. Now, go ahead, Fa. So we'll start I, with you. I was just recently in China, and uh, they're really taking IoT to the next level. So first of all, it, what it's really educated them on is the environmental impact. So they now monitor the cities like every square foot. And so what they did was, I was in Wuhan, and they replanted almost half the city in greenery. So places that were overpasses or whatever, they dug up all the cement and they planted trees. And they planted shrubs and they monitor everywhere where there's spills or water and all kinds of stuff. And this goes to like a control center and they quickly deploy people if there's a problem. And so they can, um, if there's a spill, it's cleaned up right away. They basically outlawed things like scooters, you know, the um, gas scooters and motorcycles, no longer permitted in Wuhan. It's all electric. Um, so those are the kind of things that they did with monitoring. And so I, I see how they've taken the city, now it's fully almost electronic, and they're, they're, um, you can do things with your phone, with a subway system, and it's, to me, that is where it is. And they're doing it. Yes, you, you can agree or disagree with the policy so and how they really monitor people. Civic infrastructure, but it's now. civic infrastructure. But it's giving people quality of life. What they've come to realize is is that if your citizens aren't healthy, um, they can't generate tax base, which can't afford your country. So let's keep our people healthy. Let's keep them functioning. Let's keep them moving. And because we can do that, we have an actual prosperous organ like country. And so I think that's where IoT is really going to um, the next generation. That's what I'm looking for. Seeing. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you got some thoughts? I think that the real innovative or the really interesting thing for IoT of me is sort of the, an extension of what I've always thought of as computers. So the way to extend your agency out into the world, like where to be able to do things remotely, to be able to do things at a distance. And as I have more relatives who are aging, who are living at a distance from me, who I'm not with, um, I really like the idea, which is invasive if it's done without consent, of course, mm -hmm. but I really like the idea of being able to just check on my elderly relatives to make mm -hmm. sure, okay, are you, you know, have you gotten up and gotten around today? Have you got enough okay? food in your fridge? Have the you got right enough food in your, food in your fridge, fridge, right? Yeah. Is it, I'm, my, my basement flooding, I'm going to be aware of that very quickly. But if their basement's flooding, maybe I'm interested in knowing about that because they're much less able to deal with it, right? And so this, this ability to use the IoT stuff that we have, not necessarily for my own interests, but to be able to help other people or to be aware of other people's situations, in a way that is positive, in a way that is actually consensual and helpful, uh, I think is going to be very interesting. Yeah, cool. Katie? I mean, IoT devices are amazing. I think that for all the concerns that we have, I'm very glad that they exist, and I'm glad that, they're, that there's so much innovation and that the way that they're being used is moving so quickly, especially, I think, in emergency situations. Um, you know, there are all these stories about people who have smart watches that have been monitoring their health and they suddenly realize, they're, they're, or the device will um, tell them that they're having a heart attack. And they can, the devices recognize it before you would start to feel the symptoms, so they've prevented these heart attacks from becoming really, really disastrous. Um, in some emergency situations in cities that have connected um, Internet of Things light poles, they can divert traffic using the light poles because they'll light up the direction that you should go to get out of town the fastest. And if that route becomes too crowded, then they dim those lights and they highlight the lights that go in a different way. So you just felt you know exactly what you should do and you don't have to be panicked and looking at your phone. Maybe the service isn't working, maybe whatever. Um, that's when those devices are amazing in my mind. And I think the possibilities are endless. They can do so many amazing things and I'm very hopeful for 
for where we see them 10 years from now. All right, Jeff, how about you? The good. I, you, I know. Am I the guy who's doing the most bad? <laughs> no, no, I think it's Vaughn is getting there. It gets a, no, I, I think there's huge potential there. And actually, Mike took the, my top one was the, the kind of aging society. And one conference I was at, they called it aging in place. And somehow that picture didn't resonate with me very well, but because I just imagined someone <laughs> sort of sitting in the rocking chair, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it, not going anywhere. Yeah. No, but that means you you can stay in your home and still you know be monitored in whatever way that's appropriate. Uh, I think that's a huge one. There are, there are a lot of others. I think you know there are health benefits with the fitness trackers, as Katie kind of mentioned. Um, one of the big drivers uh, I've heard in Europe and in the U.S. is energy savings mm -hmm. of just using smart home devices and better managing your energy as it kind of learns your patterns and such. Um, leak detectors, not, not that that's the, the lead thing, but uh, water, uh, you know, plumbing issues uh, that, that can flood your house are a much bigger thing than even fire in terms of insurance costs. And by using a leak detector, you can have much more efficient uh, and lower insurance costs and things like that. So I think there are a lot of ways that IoT can be used as sensors and reporters that can make a lot of elements of our lives more efficient, kind of in the background, uh, and more safe, uh, ultimately. So I think, I, I think there's a huge benefit there. Very good. Um, well, that's, uh, I think, going to wrap it up for our uh, discussion today. And I encourage you, of course, uh, folks in the room, um, seek these folks out if you have a last word. And if you're watching online, can't be too hard to Google and find out how to contact uh, everybody here. I'm certain of that. In fact, that may have happened already. Your email boxes may be filling up. So uh, Jeff, Katie, Mike, and Faust, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the Internet Society for uh, convening this panel. Thanks, Nice meeting you. All right. Thank you very much.